A young woman goes out to a bar with her friend on a warm Saturday night in Oregon. By the next morning, her family and friends lose all contact with her, with no signs of where she could possibly be, as her loved ones launch a massive search effort to locate her. A total stranger in a different city walks into a police station with a shocking revelation that would lead detectives on a multi-state manhunt tracking. An armed killer with a kidnapped victim who's desperate to keep his freedom. This is the story of Kaylee Sawyer. Kaylee Ann Sawyer was born on March 2, 1993, to parents Julie Van Cleve and Jamie Sawyer at St. Charles Medical Center in Bend, Oregon. Bend is best known for its immense beauty. The small city, situated in Deschutes County, is home to roughly 99,000 people. It is a haven for those with a deep appreciation of the outdoors and features views of snow-capped mountains and pristine lakes. Since it's an ideal family getaway destination, it's an even better place to raise children. Kaylee's parents divorced when she was in her early childhood years, but this thankfully had little effect on her relationship with either of them. They both remarried, and Kaylee had equally good relationships with her stepparents, Crystal and Chris, and her four half-siblings that came from her parents' new marriages. Kaylee, or KK as she was known, was an amazing big sister to her four younger brothers, Zach, Cody, Jaden, and Caleb. Kaylee was a bright light in the lives of those around her. She loved to get out and experience the world, with some of her favorite activities being things like snowboarding, fishing, and golfing. Kaylee attended Skyview Middle School before moving up to Mattview High School. After she graduated, Kaylee started her college career at Central Oregon Community College. She had ambitions of becoming a dentist, and in 2016, Kaylee was one step closer to this goal when she got her first job as a dental assistant. She had to balance work with college while also maintaining the relationships around her, but Kaylee was the strong and resilient type. If anyone could juggle all of that, it was her. By mid-2016, Kaylee had been dating Cameron Reimhofer for two years. The pair was in a serious relationship and seemed likely to end up getting married and start a family together. Cameron had also grown up in Bend, and Kaylee's family loved him. He treated her well, and they never doubted his love for their Kaylee. The couple lived together in an apartment near campus. On July 23, 2016, one of Kaylee's co-workers from the dental office was having their bachelorette party in town. Initially, Kaylee wasn't going to attend as she had other plans that got in the way, but in the end, she was able to move her schedule around to celebrate her co-worker's fun evening. Kaylee got all dressed up and headed out for a night of fun. The evening was your typical bachelorette party with lots of drinking and dancing. After a few hours, and once Kaylee had a fair amount to drink, she ended up briefly dancing with another guy who was there. One of Cameron's friends happened to be at the bar that night, and he saw Kaylee with the other man, so he messaged Cameron to tell him what he had seen. It is important to note that nothing happened between the two, and their interaction was brief. But you can understand why Cameron's friend would want him to know. At around midnight, Kaylee messaged Cameron and asked him to pick her up from the bar. He was there after a few minutes. On the way home, they got into an argument, likely about the person Kaylee was dancing with. It's not surprising that Cameron would have been upset by this. It was a typical argument that couples often have, but by the time they had gotten back into their apartment's parking lot, Kaylee didn't want to go inside with Cameron as they were still arguing. She needed some time to cool off, so he walked upstairs, expecting she would follow him through the door in the next ten minutes or so. That never happened. It's surreal to think that as Cameron closed the car door behind him, that was the last time he'd ever see the love of his life alive. It's not clear exactly how much time had passed when Cameron decided to go down and check on Kaylee. He wanted her to come inside so they could sort things out. Much to his shock, as he approached the car, Kaylee was not inside. Cameron tried to call her but got no answer. He then texted Kaylee, saying, Where are you? Please come home and talk to me. At least you're being unfair. Kaylee replies, Are you kidding? What a joke. I'm so sorry I'm not good enough for you. 
I don't get how you can say that if you want me. You could have, but you don't care. If you cared even a little bit, you'd know where I am. I'm sorry I'm not as important as your phone. Cameron responded, Kaylee, please just come home to be with me. I don't want to play this game. I'll start searching, but please help me out. My phone's about to die, Kaylee replies. Cameron continued, Please don't do this to me. I apologize for being upset when I picked you up. I just drove up and down College Way really slowly. I didn't see you, and I don't know where else to go. Just come back. The final message Cameron got from Kaylee read, Are you kidding? Because that's bullshit. Cameron continued to search for Kaylee into the early morning hours of July 24th. When he was unable to locate her, he returned home believing she had gone to a friend's house or called one of her relatives to pick her up. Part of him may have hoped she would walk through their door early the next morning, but this next happened. After calling her friends and family, Cameron dialed 911. Hello? Hi. Um, I'm not sure if this is quite the right number to call. Last night I got home from the bars with my girlfriend, and she got upset at me and ran off. Mm-hmm. And I chased her and wasn't able to find her, and I still haven't heard from her. Her phone's off. I called all our family, and they haven't heard from her, so I'm wondering what you recommend I do. We can put in a call, and we can uh, have officers or deputies uh, look for her. Okay. And where was she last seen at? Um, College Way. College in what? Um, Alpine Meadows Apartment Complex. It's like at the top of College Way. In that ap- apartment complex? Yes. In a specific apartment or? In the parking lot. Just in the parking lot? You guys yeah, don't live there? Or? Yes, we live there together. Okay, what's the address? He wasn't the only one concerned by Kaylee's sudden silence and random disappearance. Her mother, Julie, felt deep inside that something was seriously wrong. She, too, reported Kaylee's disappearance to the authorities. Julie feared that the authorities would not take her case seriously since Kaylee was 23 years old and a college student. This is the reason she either fabricated or exaggerated Kaylee's medical information. She hoped this would give officers an extra push to jump in, looking for her daughter, and not assume she was sleeping off a hangover and not responding to anyone. While that may be the case for some 23-year-olds, that wasn't Kaylee's behavior. While waiting to hear back from the police, Kaylee's friends and family wasted no time trying to do their part in locating her. They created missing person posters with Kaylee's picture and began placing them around town, hoping to jog someone's memory. During this time, Kaylee's mom later recalled she had a feeling that Kaylee was no longer with her. She may not have understood it at the time or even ignored it, but after the revelations of the coming days, it's clear that Julie's connection to her daughter somehow knew something had happened before any of them did. The Bend Police Department began looking into Kaylee's disappearance fairly quickly. While Kaylee's family didn't think Cameron was involved, not for a second, the investigators naturally viewed him with some suspicion. He was the last known person to see her alive, and he was her boyfriend. Cameron admitted they were in an argument that night, and as previously mentioned, it's usually someone close to the victim who is responsible for their death or disappearance. However, these were not the type of investigators who got tunnel vision. They spoke to Cameron, listened to his story, and saw his real, genuine concern for Kaylee. Speaking to her friends and family further confirmed their relationship had been solid. The next logical person to speak to was the man at the bachelorette party with whom Kaylee had been dancing. Was he an acquaintance? A complete stranger? Had he followed Kaylee and Cameron home that night or known where she lived prior to their interaction? These were all real possibilities. They found him soon enough, and by then, he had already heard about Kaylee's disappearance. Practically everyone in Bend had, despite it being less than 48 hours since she was last seen. He was taken aback by the police's questions and adamant that his involvement with Kaylee that night had been nothing more than a brief dance shared. He, too, was ruled out as a suspect. Now, the investigators had nothing. Cameron was the last person to see or speak to Kaylee. Her cell phone had not been active since she last spoke with him, and their two first suspects had been quickly ruled out. So, 
Where was Kaylee? The search continued in earnest. Even though it was clear that those close to Kaylee believed she would never have willingly disappeared, the officers working her case hoped she was cooling down somewhere. She had work on Monday. There was a chance in their minds that she would show up at her shift after having taken time away from everyone. But the start of Kaylee's Monday shift came and went. She was nowhere to be seen. They tried to have her phone pinged and managed to get a few hits around Bend. This seemed like a small sliver of positive news until they discovered one of Kaylee's old phones was still registered to her Apple account. It was this phone that they were picking up, not Kaylee's current phone. As the investigators continued to work on Kaylee's disappearance that Monday morning, they had no idea that someone was about to walk through the door and blow the whole case wide open. So could you tell me, um, and I know that you already went over this, but do, can you tell me kind of how this whole thing transpired? Um, I, I, I guess I would start with Saturday. Were you working? No, so Saturday, I didn't work Saturday, so Saturday was no more day he went to work. He did go to work? In the afternoon. So what time does he start normally, or does it change? It's always changing. Okay. So, so he was working night shift that Saturday night and getting off, I think, like 2 or 2.30 in the morning, Sunday. And what time does that uh, have him starting work-ish? I think that day he went in, or he was going to go in around 3 p.m., I think. What time did you wake up? Well, what time did you go to bed, and then what time did you wake so up? So I went to bed, I would say, a little bit after the text message, so I would say closer to midnight. Okay. And do you, did you wake up in the night at all? No, I don't remember waking up at all. Okay. Do you remember waking up in the morning? When so, you actually so I woke up around 7.30 to 8 on that Sunday morning. And was he home? Yeah, he was there when I woke up. What was he was he doing as far as like was he getting in bed? Was he eating breakfast? Yeah, he was, when I woke up he was he was in bed with me. Okay. He was already in bed. Was he yeah, awake? He was, no, he was well, we were waking up at the same time. Um I don't know if he was like awake or But we were we were it was the time to get ready to go to church. But, uh, and which, where's the church? So it's uh, La Roca, it's in Spanish, it's called a rock. Mm -hmm. It's on Division Street in Bend. Okay, and then, are you got? is it, I mean, are you noticing anything weird at all at this point? So, yeah, so he was very quiet, like on the way to church. Wasn't saying much, because it's unusual. Mm -hmm. um, at church, he was just very quiet, very withdrawn like he would usually like wrap my hand or something he wasn't doing that. so when we get out of the church I asked him what's wrong with you what's going on and I don't know you know I, we've been together for a very long time I know something's up could you get some Kleenex yeah do you want something to drink to? No. So it was strong enough for you? You didn't ask him anything about it at that point, though? No, because... So I'm still in training at work. Yeah. It's been stressful. Sure. And it's just... We've been, like... Talking about it, like, just in the sense of, like, so what if I don't make it? Or yeah, yeah. Whatnot. So we, we just been... It's been stressful in the sense of just trying to figure out... Sure. So I thought that maybe that's just it was all together. Part so I didn't that. I didn't I didn't push it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't I was just like you know, I'm feeling down to myself. Sure, so absolutely. I would have thought the same exact thing. I didn't push it. I didn't Okay. The woman in the interview footage is rookie police officer Isabel Ponce Lara. The man she is referring to is her husband, Edwin Lara. Isabel went into the police department on Monday and sat in the waiting room after having asked to speak to a supervisor. One of the sergeants walking through recognized her as being a recruit at the neighboring station. 
So they went up to Isabel to find out what she was there to talk about. They go back into a room where they will have some privacy, and another officer joins them. The story Isabel has to tell is jaw-dropping. Isabel told the officers that her husband, a campus security officer, was acting strange on Sunday after his night shift. When she confronted him about it on Monday, Edwin told his wife that he had killed someone. He claimed to have panicked and gotten rid of the body. Within minutes of telling her this story, Edwin got into his car and drove off. That is when Isabel made the brave and morally correct decision to go and speak to law enforcement about what her husband had said to her. It wasn't long before the officers' minds went to the missing 23-year-old college student, Kaylee Sawyer. Isabel said that she woke up on Sunday morning to find Edwin in bed beside her. He had gotten home sometime during the night after his shift. This was not unusual. As she mentioned in the footage, she never really knew what hours Edwin was working as his schedule always changed. After they got up, the pair got ready for church, where they went every Sunday. Edwin was a devout Christian. He outwardly took his religion seriously and was an active member of the church, participating in the band and, as I mentioned, attending every Sunday service. Isabel first noticed her husband was quieter than usual. This didn't immediately raise any major concerns for her. They were having some struggles in their relationship at the time, and he could have just been having an off day. However, as the hours went by, it became clear to Isabel that this wasn't the case. After going to church, Isabel went to the movies with Edwin and his cousin. On the way home, they dropped his cousin off and returned to their residence. The next morning, which was now Monday, Isabel noticed Edwin was staying in bed for a longer time than usual. When he came out into the living room, Isabel could see something was seriously wrong. Edwin was crying and then told her that he had accidentally hit Kaylee Sawyer with his car before panicking and hiding her body. Edwin told Isabel it was dark and Kaylee was dressed in all black. He claimed he hadn't seen her and admitted to driving faster than he should have been in his campus security car. Just waiting for him to get up so we could start the morning. So he comes out of the room and his eyes were all teary. That's what I'm like, what happened? Tell me what happened. What, what's wrong? So he sits on the sofa. I turn off the TV. And then he just says that. He's like, I, I kill a woman. That's what he said. And I'm like, what do you mean? Then he's like, I hit her with the car. And did he tell you which car? He said the the security the the job the car that they used at the job. And what and what did you say to that? So I'm like, what do you mean? What 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 do you mean you hit her? And he's like, yeah, I hit her and I panic. And I'm like, what did what do you mean by you hit her panicking? What did you do? Did did he say I hit her in a panic? He said, I don't remember exactly the words that he said, but he said something that he hit her with the car yeah. and then he panicked. Okay. So then I asked him, like, that's what I was trying for him to explain to me. So you hit her with the car. That's an accident. Yeah. Why? What do you mean you panic? What, what do you mean? And what did he say? He just kept saying, I panic. And at that point, he's already, like, he got up and he's already, like, going into the room and walking back and forth and I'm not really quite understanding what he's telling me. One can only imagine what was going through Isabel's mind as her husband spilled this information to her. Maybe it was sheer disbelief, but Edwin added an important detail. He told Isabel he had left some of Kaylee's things in their garden shed. When Isabel looked inside the shed, she saw a green handbag and a pair of black high heels. At that moment, everything must have hit her like a freight train. The evidence was staring her right in the face. This wasn't an imaginary story. Her husband really was involved in the death of the missing college student. It is a true testament to Isabel's character that she didn't even question whether to go to the police or not. It goes without saying that Edwin's story about accidentally hitting Kaylee 
made no sense. While hit and runs do unfortunately happen, the likelihood of someone accidentally hitting someone with their car and then disposing of their body in a panic is incredibly slim. Now, the investigators needed to track down Edwin Lara and try to find Kaylee, a task that would prove as dramatic as it would be difficult. Upon learning about Edwin's version of events, the investigators feared Kaylee may be alive somewhere with her time running out. If she had been hit by the car, maybe the force wasn't enough to kill her, but by now, she would be in dire need of medical care if she was still alive. The authorities secured a search warrant for Edwin and Isabel's home and took in anything that was tied to Kaylee, hoping the items would shed some light on what happened. They found Kaylee's green purse. It was covered in blood. Additionally, they found a clump of blonde hair and a large rock. That, too, had blood on it. A picture was slowly unveiled before the investigators' eyes, and it was not that of an accident. This looked like a homicide. After these discoveries, Kaylee's case was classed as a homicide. She was no longer considered a missing person, and investigators had to make the heartbreaking phone call to her family. All the while, Edwin was on the run. He had taken Isabel's gun and fled in his car. He stopped at his parents' house, leaving the vehicle there, when he spotted 19-year-old Andrea Mice sitting in the driver's side of her car in the parking lot. She had just gotten off a grueling shift at work and was about to drive home when he found her passenger door swung open. It was Edwin. He pointed the gun directly at Andrea and told her to start driving. For the next three hours, Andrea had to keep her composure as Edwin directed her along the highway. He tried to talk to her, showing her photos on his phone and even bringing up Kaylee. After about three hours, they pulled into a motel. When they went to check in, Edwin made Andrea pretend to be his girlfriend. She feared if she didn't, he wouldn't hesitate to use that gun on her. Once he had her inside the motel room, Edwin handcuffed Andrea to the bathroom door to stop her from escaping. He then took a shower. Once he was done, Edwin tried to make Andrea shower in front of him. She refused, and he then handcuffed her to the bed. At this stage, he tried to make her take sleeping pills. Andrea knew she was in serious trouble, and fatefully, an alarm happened to go off on her phone at that exact moment. Andrea's mind moved quickly, and she told Edwin that the alarm was a reminder to take her STD medication. She was praying this would prevent him from assaulting her. It did. At 1.30 a.m., Edwin made Andrea leave the motel. She could see he was getting extremely paranoid as they continued driving. At 5 a.m., they stopped at another motel. There, at the gas station, Edwin forced his way inside a 76-year-old woman's car. Again, he made sure Andrea was still with him. The woman had her two grandsons in the car with her, and Edwin forced one of them to drive the car. He did end up letting them go, but now it was Andrea in the driver's seat. He told her they were driving to California, where Edwin had family. He then asked Andrea for her phone and began recording the following video. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say that I apologize for everything I've done. Most likely I'm going to get caught. And um, sorry about that girl, about that girl in Central Oregon. And I just want to let family members screaming and I have to talk to her forever. So, you know, like I say, she's still fine. We're driving and she'll be home pretty soon. I'm sorry to her grandma and her family members, to her boyfriend. You know, I'm sorry for everything that I caused. Okay, and you'll see her pretty soon. Okay, tell the cops that not to shoot us, because if they shoot us, then that's not my fault. Okay, but sorry, everybody. Bye. Once he had finished his message, Edwin made Andrea post the video to her page and title it Murderer on the Loose. Shortly after 6.30 a.m., a California patrol officer saw the vehicle Edwin and Andrea were in speeding down the interstate, and he tried to pull them over. Edwin instructed Andrea to keep driving, 
and at 6.40 a.m., he called 911. Edwin eventually allowed Andrea to pull the car over. Before he got out of the car, Edwin recorded himself saying, I just want to say to the family of Kaylee that, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did, and in time, I will tell them where the body is. He was arrested and taken to the nearest police station. Andrea was also initially arrested until the officers soon realized she was a victim and had nothing to do with Edwin's sick behavior over the past few days. Then came the task of trying to get Edwin to tell the truth. The investigators looking to solve Kaylee's case began questioning him, and immediately, they didn't believe the story Edwin was telling. He told them that he had hit Kaylee with his car and then strangled her when she wouldn't stop screaming. One of the investigators' main priorities was finding Kaylee's body, not only to bring closure to her family, but he was also acutely aware that forensic evidence was slipping away as the days went by. The sooner they could find Kaylee, the more likely they could get some answers to what happened that night. The investigators who worked the case believe Edwin started following Kaylee along the road that night, and her family thinks he offered her a ride. As he was in his campus security car, they thought Kaylee accepted his offer, thinking this was a safe thing to do. He was someone who was employed to keep them safe, after all. Then, Kaylee found herself in the back of Edwin's patrol car, a car with doors that didn't open from the inside. He strangled her and drove her out to a more remote area where he beat her head with a large rock. That is where her body was found, in that same spot where she was left. Horrifyingly, we don't know whether Kaylee was still alive when Edwin left her there. He later went back to the scene after dropping off his patrol car and tried to cover up her body. Kaylee was found on Wednesday, July 27th, off Highway 126 near a canyon. Despite confessing to the crime, once official charges were pressed, Edwin pleaded not guilty. His defense team managed to have the full confession ruled inadmissible as evidence for the trial, stating that his rights had been violated due to not being given the option to make a phone call. As the trial was closing in, Edwin changed his tune. He pleaded guilty to aggravated murder in a plea deal that meant he avoided the possibility of the death sentence. For a man who so callously took Kaylee's life, he sure was very concerned with his own. He was given a life sentence without the chance of parole. Edwin was handed a further life sentence for his crimes against Andrea. Isabel filed for divorce from Edwin and quit her position in the police force. Given what Edwin had done, she felt unable to continue with a career in law enforcement. In the end, a two million settlement was reached and Kaylee's law was passed in 2019. It requires college security to be easy to differentiate between real police officers. The law also mandated that all college security vehicles be fitted with internal cameras. The sudden and violent loss of Kaylee Sawyer has left a massive hole in the lives of those around her. She was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, falling victim to a sick predator. Had it not been Kaylee, Edwin would have likely taken another life. As for why he did it, that remains unknown. Only Edwin knows the answer to that question, and the answer is probably buried far beneath the surface, unlikely to ever reach the light of day.